turn with me to the book of Malachi, that last little book in the Old Testament. And we're going to particularly look in Malachi chapter 3, but I want to begin in chapter 2, verse 17, and read into chapter 3, verse 6. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of the hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Let us pray. Father, we see in this, this prophecy, the, this is really the section in Malachi, the questioning of the people of God, the accusations against God, followed by this great promise of both the, the forerunner to Jesus and the Messiah himself and some descriptions of what he is going to accomplish. Again, we see the supernatural quality of the Bible and these prophecies being fulfilled. But we also see the great message of, of hope for the people of God. We thank you for your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we look at this Messianic prophecy, we see the writings of the last prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, this prophecy emphasizes the, the divine nature of the Messiah. It is God himself who will be coming to his people. Malachi also informs us that a, a messenger would come before the Messiah to clear or prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. This prophecy presents significant information concerning the coming and the work of the Messiah as well as the work of John the Baptist. I think it's important to understand the historical situation of Malachi and where he comes in biblical history. And of course, we see him in the last book in the Old Testament, uh, at least our, our, the Old Testament in terms of the, the prophets. Um, Malachi prophesied in mid-5th century B.C., and at that time the zeal and hopes of that first generation to return from the exile in Babylon had dissipated. You may remember earlier in 520 B.C. that Haggai and just about six months later Zechariah had rebuked and encouraged that first generation that had returned. Uh, he prophesied during the time of Zerubbabel and he mentioned that those, particularly Zechariah, that the power of the Holy Spirit would enable him to complete the temple. Zechariah had symbolically crowned Joshua the high priest, pointing toward the idea that the Messiah would be a priest and a king, uh, as well as the idea of the prophet. However, by the time of Malachi, uh, now a new generation was there, 
The temple had been restored. Zerubbabel, that high priest Joshua, Zechariah, Haggai, they were now dead. And a routine order had been reestablished in the land. The priesthood was restored in Israel. And there was offering the sacrifices in the temple. In the midst of that, the people had become generally apathetic to the things of God. And Malachi has an interesting literary form in the use of the series of questions and answers between God and his people. Uh, the people direct a series of questions uh, toward God and he answers, sometimes with a very strong rebuke. And often these questions of God are very accusatory, uh, like the one we just read in verse 17 of chapter 2. But look back at chapter 1 just to get a couple of, of these or the flavor of it in the book. In chapter 1, verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. Verses 6 through 8, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priest, you despise my name, but you say, how we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar, altar. but you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of the hosts? You can see the background of this. And of course, in chapter 2, verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? I mean, you can certainly see the accusatory tone in this. The Messianic prophecy in Malachi 3 is introduced with these accusations of the people against the Lord. And this question implies that God is not just, that apparently he's favoring the wicked. And the Lord's answer to this generation is a prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah who will bring justice, the people are demanding. We see in this text first, in verse three, verse, chapter 3, verse 1, that God will send his messenger to, to prepare the way for the Messiah. The first part of the verse, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will, pre will prepare the way before me. Uh, God's response begins with a call to pay attention. It says, Behold... In other words, note this, I'm going to say something important. The Lord's answer is to be heard. The Lord's going to send a messenger to clear the way before me. A single messenger is anticipated. The prediction is really a development of the prophecy in Isaiah 40, verse 3, that one is coming who will prepare the way of the Lord. It is also connected to a prediction in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And look over at those verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers, so their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Quite a final way to end this prophetic book. And the idea that Elijah would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the New Testament explains these three connected passages. The Gospels state that John the Baptist is the messenger who prepared the way of the Lord and one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And look over at Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. The 
this is when the prophecy is given concerning the, the birth of John the Baptist. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. It's really a great text against abortion right there. He's a, obviously a human being, a, poor, a, a person filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, And he will turn the many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You see the echoing of the Malachi passage in chapter Malachi 4 there. In Luke chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, Speaking of John the Baptist, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of the repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Of course, quoting the Isaiah 40 passage. Uh, John applied the Isaiah prophecy to himself as a voice crying in the wilderness in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. And Jesus identified John the Baptist as the Elijah who was to come. And look in Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, where we see Jesus directly doing that. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He also reiterates that same idea in Matthew 17, verses 12 and 13. Now, the coming of John the Baptist was the fulfillment of this prophecy in Malachi 3 and the prophecy in Malachi 4, as well as Isaiah 40, that a preparatory messenger was coming. Now, this is not any way a statement on reincarnation. John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He wasn't Elijah himself reincarnated, and I say that because I've heard people use it that way. Palmer Robertson wrote of this. He said, The witness of the New Testament scriptures to the ministry of John the Baptist as a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy is a testimony that must be reckoned with. His ministry fits exactly the description provided by Malachi. We also see in Malachi 3.1 that the Lord himself will come as the messenger of the covenant. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. After stating that this preparatory messenger was come, will come, the Lord says that he himself will come. He identifies himself as the messenger of the covenant. The Lord and messenger of the covenant are one same person in this text. Robert Raymond, in commenting on this, says, A paraphrase will bring out the salient point of God's response. You are asking, where is the God of justice? All right, I will come to you, I the Lord whom you are seeking, the messenger of the covenant whom you are desiring. That this is clear, the import of the divine response is evident in the following facts. First, that the Lord declares that it is he himself who would come is apparent both in the phrase before me and from the fact that his coming is what the people with pious hypocrisy were demanding. Nothing else would satisfy their ill-founded insistence 
that the God of justice manifest himself. Secondly, that the Lord who would come suddenly to his temple and the messenger of the covenant who would come are regarded as one and same person is evident from the unmistakable parallelism between the phrases whom you are seeking and whom you are desiring attached respectively to the two titles. The designation of the Lord as the messenger of the covenant is unique to Malachi. But it is reminiscent of an earlier reference to the angel or messenger of the Lord who went before Israel in the wilderness and brought them into the promised land. You may remember in Exodus 23, there was the angel of the Lord going before the people of Israel. And in that passage, the identification of the angel of the Lord is identified with the Lord himself. He has the power to forgive sins. And the voice of the Lord and the angel are identical in the text. However, the angel of the Lord is also distinct from the Lord, while also to mean designated the Lord. It's a kind of the figure in the Old Testament in many places that reflects the Trinity, pre-incarnate Son of God. There are some places where angel of the Lord is little a, just a created angel. And there are other places where you would put capital A, that it's actually this reflection of the Trinity in the Old Testament deity. New Testament authoritatively states that Jesus was the messenger of the covenant in some of the statements of Jesus. For example, in Matthew 26, 28, in the Lord's Supper passage there, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Luke 22, 20, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Seeing the Lord's Supper, the Lord establishing, Jesus establishing the Lord's Supper, and then ratifying that new covenant in his own blood on the cross. Jesus as the God-man, the Messiah who is divine and human, truly divine, truly human, is the messenger of the covenant. He fulfilled all the old covenant shadows and types and prophecies concerning himself. He fulfilled the promises of redemption that were given in the covenant of grace throughout the Old Testament and the Bible. His perfect obedience to the law of God and his bearing the penal sanctions of the law on the cross dealt with all of our needs before a holy God. And fulfilling all these old covenant promises and shadows, he then established the new covenant. Malachi says that the Lord will come for two reasons, to purify and to punish. The Lord's answer to the question of Malachi 2.17 is that he will come and he will execute the promises and the curses of the covenant. Malachi 3.2, But who can endure the day of this coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. You see in this emphasized first in his work of purification, verses 2 and 3, But who can endure the day of this coming, who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap then he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Here using Old Testament figures and language, it projects forward to the people of God being purified and bringing their offerings before the Lord. The Messiah in his work of purification will refine and purify the sons of Levi as gold and silver. And of course, ultimately, the work of the Messiah results in the Levitical priesthood being replaced by the priesthood of all believers by everyone coming directly into the presence of the Lord with Jesus being their mediator. 
We see some passages of the New Testament reflecting this idea. And let me look, let's, look at it. let's look at just a couple of them. Uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5. I'll read in verse 4 to get the full context. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, are being like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And in verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people through his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The same idea is in Revelation particularly in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Great passage on Christ's work of purchasing us or redeeming us for God. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God them of the tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Here's the kingdom and priest idea, now the people of God. Uh, translation ransomed, sometimes it's translated purchased, sometimes redeemed. It's uh, in Greek, it's a word group, agorazo, a word group, which is a marketplace word. Uh, something being ransomed, redeemed, or purchased. All those ideas are contained in it. Well, how did the Messiah create this priesthood of believers? Again, by what's classically called his active and passive work. He kept perfectly the law of God for us. And on the cross, he bore all the, the curses, sanctions of the lawbreaker for us. In fact, in our justification, when we believe in Jesus and we are forgiven, it's because of his work on the cross that makes that possible. When we are accepted before God as righteous because of Christ's righteousness imputed to us, it is his perfect life, his righteousness that's imputed to us. So by what we could call his preceptive and his penal obedience, another way of describing that, he met every need associated with our salvation. Uh, John Murray wrote, he said, God cannot deny himself to be complacent toward that which is the contradiction of his own holiness would be a denial of himself. So that wrath against sin, which is a correlate of his holiness, and this is just saying that the justice of God demands that sin receive its retribution. The question is not at all, how can God, being what he is, send men to hell? The question is, how can God, being what he is, save them from hell? How he saves them is in Christ's perfect life, in Christ's death for our sins. Again, he meets every demand of his holiness and justice and every demand of his love and mercy and grace in Christ's life and death and resurrection. When we use the term persons being saved or been saved, have the other considered what we're saved from? Certainly we are saved from our sins and that's a biblical idea. We are also saved from God's justice. We are saved from what our sins deserve before a holy God. And God saved us by fulfilling every aspect of his justice in Christ. Jonathan Edwards 
preaching on this idea, said the grace of God in bestowing this gift is most free. It was what God was under no obligation to bestow. He might have rejected fallen man as he did fallen angels. It's what we never did anything to merit. It was given while we were yet enemies and before we had so much as repented. It was from the love of God who saw no excellency in us to attract it. And it's the mere grace that the benefits of Christ are applied to such and such particular persons. Those that are called and sanctified are to attribute it alone to the good pleasure of God's goodness by which they are distinguished. He is sovereign and hath mercy on whom he will have mercy. This cleansed new covenant priesthood will present to the Lord offerings in righteousness in Malachi 3.3. 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. They are justified before God. They are Christ's work and they accept it as righteous in God's sight. They offer spiritual sacrifices before the Lord of their praise and thanksgiving. We just read in 1 Peter 2, 5, I'm bringing these types of spiritual sacrifices of worship. Hebrews 13, 15 mentions the same thing of bringing a sacrifice of praise before our Lord. And this is the only way, this is why the only way we can come to God is through Christ. Only He is the mediator of the new covenant. Only He is the one whose perfect work met all the demands of God's justice. Only he, through his work of redemption, purchased people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation for God and made them a kingdom of priests to the Lord. If you're in Christ, if you believe in him and rely upon his perfect work alone, you are cleansed, you are forgiven, you're accepted as righteous before God, and you can come to God. Your prayers and your worship are accepted before God as offerings of righteousness because of Christ's righteousness imputed to you and because he is our mediator. This gives us assurance of God's love and acceptance and care. If you're in Christ now, you can have that assurance and be confident as you come before God. We also see, though, in this text, his coming in judgment. In verse 5, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. A sermon that R.C. Sproul preached years ago had a similar text to this out of 2 Peter. It was in a very large church. He said, those of you who may be committing adultery here today, take heed of this. God's not going to ignore it. <laughs> and uh, it was a very strong statement to a 2,000, 3,000 member church. And it's pretty safe to... Uh, say that probably to that large body. In fact, writing in Table Talk back in 1999, he made this st statement in a, an article. He said, the pride that goes before destruction and the haughty spirit that precedes a fall is an attitude that assumes that God is unaware of what is going on or if aware is powerless to do anything about it. Unpunished sin evokes a fearlessness in the sinner by which he grows ever more brash in his defiance. The sinner mistakes God's patience and long suffering for impotence and carelessly heaps up for himself wrath against the day of wrath. The longer the judgment is delayed, the worse it is when it falls. Because of God's holiness, sin has an infinite disvalue before him. 
Now, Peter, many people object to the concept of God's justice and the idea that sin deserves an eternal punishment. I've had conversations with people who said, well, you know, okay, we do some little thing and some little peccadillo. It doesn't really matter that much. And, and then you're punished eternally for it. Um, however, the only way we can know what sin deserves before a holy God is if God reveals it to us. Human reason and act speculation cannot determine the offense of sin before a holy God, a God who is infinitely holy. And sinful man thinks his sin often doesn't really matter, that his crimes against God are light or inconsequential. Daniel Defoe made an interesting statement one of his works where he said, justice is always violent to the party offending. The ready man is innocent in his own eyes. I can remember doing some prison ministry uh, one time at a maximum security prison and I was with a group of men. Every one of them was a, a heinous murderer. Um, and uh, every one of them had an excuse of why what they did was not really that bad as we talked about sin and so forth. God declares that no one is innocent and his wrath is revealed from heaven against un all the ungodliness of men. Paul declares in Acts 17.30 that God commands all people everywhere to repent. To those who do not repent, to those who do not believe in Jesus, submit to him and God's plan of salvation, Jesus the God-man will bring judgment. In fact, as we mentioned last week in, in Revelation 6, the very last verse in that chapter talks about people calling on the caves and the rocks to fall on them to save them from the wrath of the Lamb. Here's that, you know, Jesus, gentle, mild, sweet, kind Jesus being the one that brings judgment. In fact, remember in Matthew 25, when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, in verse 46, the goats go away into eternal punishment, and the redeemed go to eternal life. There's a parallel there between the eternal punishment and eternal life. If you're in Christ, He is your purity and righteousness, and you can never come into condemnation. If you're not in Christ, this text is a strong warning, a call to repentance and belief in Jesus, the only way of salvation. A.W. Pink wrote that the divine way of salvation is the most stupendous monument of divine wisdom and grace, of sovereignty and power, of justice and mercy that ever was exhibited in this world. God has provided a Savior who by his virtuous life and vicarious death has made atonement for sin, but which all his people obtained eternal life. The whole scope of the revelation from the first intimation made in Eden, Genesis 3.15, that first messianic promise, to the end of the New Testament bears witness to this marvelous and precious way of salvation. The divine promises declared it, the types illustrated it, the prophets foretold it. When the Son of Man was here, he announced that he came to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, 28. The uniform teaching of the epistles is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Charles Spurgeon succinctly said it well when he said, Brethren, we have a tale to tell. As simple as sublime. What's simpler? Believe and live. What more sublime? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your plan of salvation for the mercy we would received in Jesus, for really the demonstration of your justice in the death of Christ on the cross and his being a propitiatory sacrifice for us, for the demonstration of your love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
and that now much more being justified by his blood we will be saved from the wrath of God that the idea of condemnation of wrath coming upon those in Jesus is an utter impossibility because he fulfilled every demand of your justice for us for those in Christ for those who believe pray that we would never take that grant for granted or presume upon your grace but see how much mercy has been given to us pray that you would motivate us toward worship toward service and the giving of our lives because of what you had done for us in Jesus name